Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're sitting comfortably, because I am. <laughs> and it is a pleasure to be with you. I told my wife during the week that there was a shortage of water here. And as we had a surfeit of water recently, I asked her to send some to you. So it would appear that that has happened today. And I am simply delighted for you. And thanks for the invitation to talk about a book of scripture that has influenced me for many years, the book of Daniel. It may seem very remote. I believe it refers to a time 25 centuries ago or so. But nevertheless, it resonates with so many of the issues that constantly face us today. So let me briefly introduce a few basic ideas. And the first one is a question of culture, that we're dealing with a very high culture indeed. At the time when Daniel was written, the city of Babylon was one of the wonders of the ancient world. The Babylonians had developed methods in very many different fields that we would recognize today. They had the beginnings of an idea of how to build skyscrapers. They were brilliant at hydraulics and drainage. They built uh, vast platforms for observing the stars and trying to make some sense out of their movements. They did get astronomy mixed with astrology, but their mathematics was nothing less than spectacular when you think of the script they were using. And their influence is so all permeating that most of us tonight have evidence of Babylon attached to our person because we've got instruments for measuring time. And there are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour, and that goes right back to Babylon because they discovered that the number 60 being divisible by quite a large number of whole number factors was a very useful base to which to work. So it was a very high culture indeed. And Daniel and his friends were captured by a raid by Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of Babylon. And being a sophisticated monarch, he chose the brightest people in the nations he captured, took them to King's College Babylon, and put them through an education for three years. I think that's where Cambridge and Oxford got the idea from. Their transition from Judah to Babylonia was a matter of a few days. But they moved from one culture to a totally different culture. In Judah, it was a narrowly monotheistic culture. And outside the theology of it, it had nothing of the advances, the scientific advances, the artistic, literary, music advances of Babylonia. And suddenly, they find themselves having to learn a new language, subject to new laws, and finding everything completely different. In the country I come from, I've stayed there all my life, but the culture has totally changed around me. And that happens in many countries in the world. We don't move, but the culture changes, and we begin to sense things are not like what they were. And the transition of Babylon, of Daniel and his friends to Babylon, is very like what has happened in the UK and in Europe. We've moved from a moderately monotheistic culture with a strong influence over over a thousand years of Christianity to an increasingly secular culture. Now, Babylon was a polytheistic culture, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the main point I want to make tonight is this. <clears throat> 
that here were teenagers. Normally people were enrolled, so far as we know, in the University of Babylon at about 15. They lose their family. They lose most of their friends. They're just four lads together. And the amazing thing about them is that Daniel rose to occupy a position in world history that is unique. That is, he rose to rule, essentially, under the emperor over two consecutive empires. That has never happened before. The nearest thing I can think of it is the position of Hong Kong where Hong Kong was ruled by the British for quite a while, and then it was transitioned to the Chinese. And the story of that transition, I cannot tell it here, but it is utterly fascinating, because it might surprise you there were Christians involved at a very high level indeed, managing that transition. But here were Daniel and his friends in a completely new culture, now, I'm, as you can see, I'm pretty old. And I've lived to see many people who still go to church, and they still read their Bibles, but something happened to them along the way. And they have lost the cutting edge of their witness. Their faith in God and Christ has become privatized under the pressure of the kind of attitude that characterizes my society, you don't do God in public. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I do do God in public. And I think it's enormously important that we fight against that currency of thought that suggests that God is a purely private matter. The creator of the universe cannot be a purely private matter. But that raises a very important question that we can use to analyze this book. Because Daniel, he didn't lose his piety, he didn't lose his devotion. That's often the case. But he didn't lose his cutting edge public witness. And when I approach this book, one of the big questions I ask is, can we learn anything from his experience that would put steel into our hearts and give us the guts to go out and face the public with what we believe to be true? What was the secret of his stability and his courage in the public space? And we're going to analyze just a little bit of that and chat about it tonight. The British Museum and the Pergamon Museum in Berlin are places where you can see spectacular remnants of the kind of artistry in Babylon. And I have often gone to the Babylonian section of the British Museum simply to admire the level of that culture. And that, of course, must have raised the question for Daniel and his friends. There's nothing like it in Judah. It was a tiny little state hardly maintaining its existence and rapidly to lose its existence. They had nothing like this culture, and yet the culture was the most idolat idolatrous in the ancient world at that time. What could be wrong with it? That was a big question because Daniel and his friends, quite obviously, once they got over the trauma, which must have been very real, of losing their parents and so on, in the end, they entered into the study in Babylon with great vigor. They didn't run away and form an exclusive ghetto in the desert. No, they took advantage of the study in that university of Babylon. Just as I have taken advantage of study in universities in the United Kingdom. But we'll have a look at that a bit later. Coming to the book itself, it's a very odd book because it is written in two languages. I'm not saying it's bilingual, but the language changes. There's Hebrew and Aramaic and then Hebrew. And that's very odd, and the scholars argue about what that could possibly mean. But not being a scholar, I rush in where angels fear to tread. And I simply observe that the book of Daniel was not in its entirety written by Daniel. Chapter 4 is written by Nebuchadnezzar. 
It's in the first person, I, Nebuchadnezzar. And therefore, it's a testimony of how the most powerful man at the time in the ancient world came to believe in Daniel's God. And that bit is embedded in the Aramaic part. Aramaic was a lingua franca, Hebrew was not. So here we have from the ancient world, at least, a kind of tract which announced to the world that the emperor had become a believer in God. And why? And that's a very remarkable thing. Think today if we had writings of leading politicians in the world describing how they'd found God, we'd use them. And so we look at it as a book by Daniel, and yes, it is. But there's a great deal about it in, the, in its first half, at least, about Nebuchadnezzar the emperor, and we need to look at it through his eyes, how it was that Daniel and his friends communicated God to this man whose concept of God was simply a polytheistic one. And then we come to a question of authenticity. The book of Daniel has provoked a lot of controversy over the years because it is, at least in part, a predictive prophecy. It claims to be talking about the future beyond the time of Daniel. Now, if Daniel lived in the 6th century BC, towards the end of the book, he appears to be writing about the time from Alexander the Great down to Antiochus Epiphanes II. And the accuracy of the complex interchanges, the ebb and flow of war, particularly between the north and the south, and constantly battling in the land of Palestine, has led many people to think that he must have lived in the second century BC. Why? Because he got it right. And that raises a very interesting question. Is it predictive prophecy that was revealed to Daniel before it happened? Or is it retrospective writing that's put into the mouth of somebody called Daniel and it pretends to be from the 6th century. Now that raises a huge question of the supernatural dimension to this book and elsewhere. And the interesting thing is that Daniel himself deals with this question within the book. Whether we get to that tonight or not, I just don't know. But we shall see. Extra biblical evidence is there. There are all kinds of beautiful um, cuneiform cylinders in the British Museum written in this cuneus in Latin is a wedge, this web-shaped writing. And if you saw their mathematics done in this stuff, you would be amazed how they can calculate anything. Now, this was found at the ziggurat or the skyscraper at Ur, south of Babylon, one at each corner, and it celebrates Nabonidus, one of the emperors commencing his rebuilding. And very interestingly, there is this Babylonian chronicle which explicitly mentions the capture of Jerusalem in 597 BC. So we've got external evidence supporting what we read inside the book of Daniel. The next question is the worldview of the Babylonians. And it was quite complex. It's a fairly typical worldview of the ancient Near East. They believed in many gods. Creation proceeded through sexual unit, um, union of the gods. But the most important thing is that they had a theogony and not simply a cosmogony. Cosmogony is the idea that the universe had a genesis. And we're very familiar with that in terms of the Big Bang and all the rest of what astrophysics has to tell us. But in addition, the ancient Near Eastern worldview had a theogony, 
That is, the gods were not eternal. They were generated. And they were generated from the primeval stuff of the universe. They had, long before moderns thought of it, the idea of a primeval soup. They had a primeval sea. And the gods were generated from this primeval soup. And their gods were, of course, essentially deifications of the forces of nature. Now, what is extremely interesting to me and begins to show us the relevance of this book to the contemporary world is that they deified those forces of nature. And if you take a physicist like Paul Davis, whose books I like to read, he will accept to a certain extent the kind of design argument that says, look, the laws of nature, the motions of the planets seem to indicate to us that there's vast intelligence out there. But he says, of course, it isn't supernatural intelligence. It's superhuman, but not supernatural. It must have evolved from the primeval stuff of the universe just as we have done. That is exactly what the Babylonians believed. The only difference is they called them gods. And we might as well today because for many of my atheist colleagues, the forces of nature are the ultimate controllers. And denying God, they cannot get away from the idea of creation. So instead of a transcendent God who causes the universe to exist and sustains it, they invest matter and energy with creative powers. Well, they used to. Nowadays, they've got down to investing nothing with creative powers. So that for the first time in my life, I never thought we'd get there. The choice for us is between God and nothing as the originator of the universe. And I would just point out that the universe comes from nothing physical. It does not come from nothing. It comes from God who is spirit and not physical. But that's a story for investigation another time. The point is that when you just get rid of the extraneous theistic God's language from Babylon, they are like contemporary naturalists or more accurately materialists. And therefore, Daniel is facing a culture in the University of Babylon later that's very similar to our culture, particularly in Europe. And that makes this book enormously relevant. How do you deal with that kind of pressure? Now, the book itself has got a fascinating literary structure. It's obviously not chronological because the revelations of seven and eight occur before chapter six. Neither is it neatly divided into prophecy and narrative. But as Professor David Gooding showed many years ago, it has a very distinctive and clear literary structure and thought flow. Treating scripture as literature is very important because I discovered in my young days that my problem with the Bible was I treated it as less than a book. I wasn't even applying the ordinary canons of thought that I'd apply to any book. And therefore, I got very little out of it. So I was very glad to have uh, a mentor who helped me to see. And Daniel is one of the clearest. Now, this is going to be the most rapid introduction to a book of the Bible that you've ever heard. Daniel has 10 major sections, and they follow the chapters up until the last one. The story in the university where Daniel refuses the king's food. Then Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he sees a colossal image that gets toppled. Then he builds a colossal real image of gold and asks everybody to bow down and worship it. Then Nebuchadnezzar gets proud about Babylon, and he is cut down, and he behaves like an animal for seven years. And then Belshazzar, who takes the golden vessels from the temple the vessels from Jerusalem, and uses them to worship his gods in. The writing comes on the wall, and it condemns him. 
And that's the climax. The death of Belshazzar is the end of the Babylonian dynasty. It's not the end of Babylon city. That confuses some people. We're talking about Babylon all the way through. But there's a regime change. And the Babylonian dynasty gives way to the Medo-Persian dynasty. And that joint, so to speak, occurs in the book of Daniel. And it is a very important and interesting joint indeed. Then, in the Medo-Persian dynasty, Darius wants to promote Daniel. And the civil servants don't like Daniel. And they concoct a very clever scheme to pitch him the law of his God against the law of the Medes and Persians. And he gets thrown in the lion's den and God rescues him. You then have a vision that Daniel had of four beasts or animals. That's followed by a vision of two animals. And then chapter 9, Daniel is studying scripture and he takes it very seriously and he realizes that the time of the exile is about to end and he wonders what's going to happen. And he prays about the city of Jerusalem and he discovers to his horror really that a lot more things have to happen before Jerusalem can look to any restoration. And then chapters 10, 11, and 12 obviously form a connected argument. And they are a revelation, not like chapter 9, which is scripture, Jeremiah. They are a revelation of something called the writing of truth that discusses the time of the end. Now, if you look at that for a long time, you will see that it has a shape that helps carry the message. You start off with one chapter, administration in Babylon. Then there are two images, a dream image and a real image. And then you get the discipline of two kings, Nebuchadnezzar's madness and Belshazzar being executed. And then you have another single chapter, administration in Medo-Persia, the civil servants against Daniel. Then you have a pair of visions of animals. And then you have a pair of explanations of two different kinds of writings. And so if you set them side by side, you see that the book splits into two halves. And the end of the first half coincides with the end of Babylonian supremacy. The end of the second half is the time of the end, looking way off into the future, because Daniel is one of the only books in the Old Testament that mentions the resurrection of the dead. So the, the um, scope of the entire book is very considerable indeed. So with that very rapid background, let's look at one or two of the principles that help Daniel maintain his stability, just to give you a flavor of the idea. Now, here's the very start of the book. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So that the book begins with a historical annotation. But it's not merely a historical annotation. It's a very unusual, and we might say a very daring interpretation of history. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, who was a very weak king of a tiny state, into the hand of the great emperor with all the vast armies at his disposal. And any contemporary historian would say, this is absurd. You see, if it had said, and the Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar into the hand of Jehoiakim, that would have been pretty impressive. But it doesn't. It says the Lord gave Jehoiakim into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And any secular historian would say, don't be ridiculous. This is simply a matter of the survival of the fittest. This is the big state, the big empire with all the weapons, trampling on very easily a very weak state. 
and yet Daniel risks the criticism. He says God was behind it. Now think about it. This is a global seismic shift in history. It was traumatic for Daniel and his friends. And yet he believed that God was behind it. And this raises something very important. And one of the secrets, I believe, open secrets, of what helped him. He had a sense of the God of global history. And he had a sense of the God of his own personal history. And you know, it's very easy to believe in a God of both histories if everything's going well. But if global history interferes with your personal history and leads to pain and suffering and uncertainty and doubt and despair and horror, that's a different matter altogether. And perhaps some of you are sitting there in an audience this size. There are about to be people here who have a big question mark over their personal history. Has God forgotten me? Can I really trust him? Because something has happened. Perhaps you're not responsible for it. It's happened in that sense globally at some level. And you're an unwilling victim of it. And it gives you the impression that God has lost control. That's a huge question, ladies and gentlemen. And it's the question with which this book begins. It invites us to ask the question because from a secular point of view, it's such an absurd statement. But then you see, that sense of the hand of God behind history, both global and personal, is one of the most stabilizing things in life. It is a magnificent thing to know that God is in that ultimate sense. And it's very complex. God's control is unfathomable in my view. And you see examples of it in Scripture. But I think that what Daniel's doing, he's writing as an old man. And he's writing about the big things in his history. So that's number one. But then that sentence didn't end there. You see, I deliberately didn't read you the whole sentence. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Of all the things you might write in this highly compressed document, what on earth are you doing writing about Nebuchadnezzar pinching some of the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem? Now, as a mathematician, a kind of scientist, I suppose, if you're generous, um, I'm interested in anomalies in science. They are the interesting things. Why is that anomalous? It's exactly the same in Scripture. This just shouts at you. What is this doing here? You haven't yet been introduced to Daniel. But you're told about this incident of taking the vessels, taking them to Babylon, and then a double statement. The temple of his God, and he put them in the treasure house of his God. Now, the idea of a museum is very ancient. And Babylon had many of them attached to temples where Nebuchadnezzar, displayed the artifacts that he had obtained in his various raids about the place. Museums are like that, aren't they? They're full of stolen, I mean, they're full of all kinds of, <laughs> they're full of all kinds of artifacts that are sometimes obtained by slightly underhand means that we needn't go into. And these emperors were quite naive. And you can just imagine this little section marked Judah on the such and such, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I conquered this nation. And here's some of their artifacts. They're rather beautiful, aren't they? What a clever boy I am to have conquered this nation. It was that kind of naive, childish pride that drove these people. But there's more to it than that. Why mention it? Well, these were golden and silver vessels. In the temple at Jerusalem, they stood for something.
they stood for the biblical scheme of values. Gold was their most precious metal. And there was a lot of it in the temple, actually, in Solomon's temple. And the psalmist, as he sat there contemplating it, says every bit of it shouts glory. It was a simple, obvious symbol of the glory of God as their supreme value. Now, let's just think about that for a moment. Because our first issue was history. Now we're moving to something utterly crucial, then and now. And that is the question of values. Now, to Daniel and his friends, those vessels symbolized absolute value. Now, there's a question for the 21st century. Is there such a thing as absolute value? Is there such a thing as absolute truth? Or is everything relative? It always amuses me, the people that insist on telling me that everything is relative and they expect me to take that statement as an absolute. It's odd, isn't it? But that's curious, inverted, incoherent thinking. But let's think of what he did. To Daniel, this was absolute value. He put it in a museum display of one little country. In other words, for him, it was of relative value. And that is to say he did what many people do. He relativized the absolute. That is a trend he observed. Have you observed it? Now, we're going to learn later on that he couldn't rest content with relativizing the absolute because you can't live without absolute. So he absolutized the relative. And that happens in chapter 3, where he makes a statue of gold and commands everybody, the, at least his nobility and elite, to bow down and worship it. He's absolutizing the relative, in this case, the state. But these days, it can be one of a fairly small number of things. Power, sex, money. And there's a risk in our hearts that we do that. And the only thing that's protecting us from absolutizing the relative is that we regard God as absolute. Now, there's a Christian version of this. And you've probably prayed it. Our Father hallowed be your name. Hallowed means set apart as absolute value. And it's one of the secrets of our witness to the world. The Apostle Peter says that if we're going to be able, as he commands us all to do, to be ready to give a defense to anybody who asks us a reason for the hope that is within us, please notice, ladies and gentlemen, that that is not preaching. Give an answer to people who ask you. That isn't preaching. That's dialogue. It's conversation between two people or three. You've got to be ready to do that. How are you going to be ready to do that? And he prefaces it by talking about fear, which is very natural. And then he says, set apart Jesus in your hearts as Lord. That is, we've got to be clear as to who our absolute value is if we're going to have the courage to witness into our society. Now, you might want to question me about this because I find that people today, there's a lot of fear around the place, and I understand it. I don't care who you are. We've all got a level of fear where we're forced by peer pressure to duck it. And how you can overcome it in a society that's ever increasingly complex and the first argument is, look, if people ask me questions, what do I do if I can't answer them? Well, if that's of interest to you, ask me in the question time. Because now we're going to move on a little bit, you see. 
we're going to move on to the next question, which is a question of education. And Nebuchadnezzar chose the top people in the countries he contacted, uh, he overcame, and he had them educated at the top university in Babylon. And his method, so far as we understand, was to keep the brightest in Babylon, and the next brightest he would send back to the countries from which they came to rule for him. And there is an interesting description of what he does. They were to choose use uh, without blemish of good um, <clears throat> appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Now, this is a very enlightened civil service because it taught them literature. I wonder how many civil services in the world teach literature. Why would you teach literature? Because, of course, literature gets you in contact with the soul of a nation. And Nebuchadnezzar was bright enough to understand that if people were going to rule efficiently, they needed to know not merely the language, but the literature. And you know, that is application. Paul, the apostle, loved the Greeks enough to have read their stuff. Do you read their stuff? I mean the stuff of the people out there, what they believe, so that when Paul was put on the spot, he was able to quote true insights of pagan Greek poets to build bridges between himself and his audience. If you start reading the newspaper, you can begin to do that, and to find out what makes people tick and what's concerned them and so on. So Nebuchadnezzar's educational policy at King's, um, sorry, at King's College Babylon was a very interesting thing. And the food was terrific because they were fed from the, from the king's table. And they were to be examined in the end, very unusually, by the emperor. He was a bright boy. He did the final exams himself of the top people. And they were to stand before the king. And then Daniel and his friends are introduced. And it says that the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. This is fascinating to me. This is a very early example of social engineering. You see, their names had meaning. And I imagine a conversation that happened in the student dining hall on the first evening when these four chaps were sitting in a corner feeling pretty grim, I imagine. And some thoughtful Babylonian student comes up and says, guys, who are you? I haven't seen you around here before. My name's Nabu. Um, I, I'm actually named after the moon god. Who are you? Well, I'm Daniel. You're what? Daniel. Never heard the name before. What sort of a name is that? I mean, my name has a meaning. It, it, it's the name of the moon god. What does your name mean? Well, it means God is my judge. It means what? God is my judge. What ethnic group are you from? I'm a Hebrew. Oh, dear, I'm really sorry. I did hear that Nebuchadnezzar beat you people up a while back. But don't worry, you'll get used to university. And this is a wonderful city to study. But your name, God is my judge... I mean, does it surprise you that he overcame you if you have a name like that? What a grim idea, having a God that's always watching you. And now I hear the voice of Christopher Hitchens in one of our debates saying, your God is like a North Korean dictator in the sky, always watching you. And I said, Christopher, you make me really sad. Do you know, I have somebody watching me all the time. 
and I don't mind it a bit. She's called my wife. <laughs> and the reason I don't mind it a bit is because she loves me. And your caricature of God is a tragedy. Because if you once begin to understand that God loves you, you will be very grateful that he watches you all the time. God is my judge. Well, that's absurd, says Nabu. You poor chap. And you can just see Daniel's wheels of his mind working. Nabu, we're all in a course doing law. That's right. And we've got the Code of Hammurabi tomorrow, I believe. Introductory lectures in the Code of Hammurabi. Are you interested in law? He said, of course, we're all interested in law. I, I'm hoping myself to be a lawyer. Oh, really? And possibly even a judge. Oh, so you do believe in judgment. Tell me, Nabu, what is the basis of judgment? Is it relative or is it transcendent? You can just see the argument start, can't you? Marvelous possibility to use his name to witness to one of the big questions of our contemporary world. When I studied medical ethics, one of the most interesting courses was in law. They tried to persuade me to stay another year to get a degree in law. But my brother keeps pointing out I'm perishing by degrees, so it was better <laughs> to stop that. But anyway, um, law. You're studying law. And what I found out in studying bioethics is there's one question that people avoid. They avoid it in medical ethics. They avoid it in business ethics. They avoid it in ordinary legal procedure and everywhere else. And it's the question, who said so? What is the authority of your ethics? Nobody wants to answer that. And it's most interesting, studying cases, complex ethical cases in the high court where you see them floundering. They don't want to pin down the source of their ethics. That's why we're in such confusion in Europe, by the way. We've denied the transcendent source of law that's been there for centuries. And now it's all relative, and nobody knows on what to base law. They, if you disbelieve in God, you're going to base it on nature, either raw nature or sophisticated, evolved nature, so to speak. But then you've got a huge choice within biology. If you follow one line, you will um, follow somebody like Spencer, the, the, the survival of the fittest, and we all know what that's led to in law. Or you follow somebody like Darwin, who studied ants and saw that they cooperated, and he thought that could be a basis of altruism. The trouble with getting law from beneath humanity. From the animal kingdom, as you can set up any system, you'll find every single system of ethics imagined that you could ever think of. That raises huge questions. But of course, there were other lads there, and I can imagine Hananiah coming in and saying, look, Daniel, just shut up a minute, because he needs to hear what my name means. The Lord shows grace. Oh, so you believe in the grace God and Daniel believes in the judge God. No, 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 we don't believe in multiple gods, says Mishael. Who is what God is? Mishael, there is only one God. And then Azariah gently in the end coming in and said, guys, my name means the Lord helps. This is real to us. Now, but why don't you watch us for a few weeks? and see if there's any reality in our behavior. They could use their names to witness, couldn't they? But they weren't allowed to. Their names were changed. Because that's what Babylon does, it changes names. And in some cases, their new Babylonian names were a parody of their Hebrew names. Look at Meshach, Mishael, Meshach. Aku is the moon god. Mishael, who is what God is, the true God. Who is what the moon god is. They couldn't help it. This is social engineering of the kind that puts everybody in blue jeans. That makes everybody look exactly the same. 
The tall poppy, as the Australians say, must be cut down. And there is enormous pressure in our society to do that. They mustn't carry an identifier, not even a cross, that might identify them as something different from the norm. It is a brilliant way of producing conformity. And it happens subtly out in our society. I won't talk, start to talk to you about that. But it is a very subtle thing. It has a history, and this is a very important history. Because Babylon in the ancient world was not Beijing or New York or London, it was Babylon, and it stood for something. What did it stand for? Will you remember the story? Let's make a city and a tower that it might reach to heaven. And let us make a name for ourselves that we won't be scattered in all the earth. And so they built a skyscraper. And if you've ever studied the philosophy of skyscrapers, it's very interesting. And the bottom line is that behind every skyscraper, there's an even bigger ego. Have you noticed that every country practically in the world wants to build the tallest building? Have you ever asked why that is? Well, you should. Let us make a name for ourselves. Because you see, name is now a question of identity. Who am I? How do I construct meaning in my life? And that's exactly what Babel tried to do. And they were going to reach to heaven, and it's almost comical. I think the writer of Genesis had a sense of humor. He said God came down to see their city. They hadn't quite reached heaven, apparently. He came down to have a look at it. Now, in the next chapter of Genesis... God calls a man called Abram. And he says to him, leave your country. I will make your name great. There are two ways of gaining significance, ladies and gentlemen. One is to restlessly try to push our way into making a name for ourselves. And it's a method that is all too common. Push the other guy out of the way if you have to. But above all, create an identity for yourself. Or we learn to be content with the identity that God gives us. And that isn't always easy for Christian People have difficulty with their name. Who are they? And as they see other people who are more intelligent, brighter, wealthier, all this kind of thing, the doubt creeps in. Years ago, I was talking about things like this. And just as I came to an end, a lovely girl came up and she stood and she lifted her face to the audience. She was beautiful. Half of her face was beautiful. The rest of it was blotched by an extremely large and very ugly birthmark. And I wondered what she was doing there. And she looked at us with her head up. And she said, I've been listening to this. And she said, I want to say publicly for the first time in my life, I want to thank God for who I am. There wasn't a dry eye in the place. She said, I'm not a fatalist. I'm not a determinist. But she said, I've come to see that I can accept this from the hand of a loving God. And I remember sitting there, I wasn't very old, and saying, have you got that far? Have you got that far? This is big stuff, isn't it? It is so deep and important. So God is prepared to give us a name, however little it may appear to other people, or however great. If it's significance coming from God, it gives us a true identity. And now to come rapidly to an end, just to encourage you, Daniel's name was changed by Babylon. It was restored by Medo-Persia. His name is retained 
to the end of the book. But now, finally, the protest against the food in the refectory. And students do this all the time. You probably did it yourselves. Look back and be honest. Did you always enjoy the food that was served up? No. Although I must say the food in South Africa is something else, but I'm not going to that. And Daniel, it says, resolved not to defile himself with the food and the wine that was served up. And there are all kinds of thinking about this. Was it to do with Israel's food laws? It could well be. And there are various reasons that I cannot develop now. But I want to suggest that he was protesting against the worldview that was behind the education. Now, why do I suggest that? Well, because... He wasn't simply protesting about the food. Everybody concentrates on the food in the scholarly articles I've read. Most people forget the wine. Daniel was not teetotal. He liked South African wine, actually. But anyway, you can read later in the book that he hadn't let wine pass his lips for a number of weeks, which showed that he normally drank it. So this is not a teetotal protest. Well, what is it then? Well, think about it. The first half of the first chapter of the book talks about the vessels that were taken to Babylon. The second half talks about a protest against the wine. The final chapter, the climax of the Babylonian Empire was when those two concepts come together in chapter 5, and Belshazzar gets the vessels out and pours wine into them and invites or forces his nobility to drink to the gods from those golden vessels. And the hand comes out. And everybody understood what it wrote, but nobody did. Because they were familiar marks that would be on weights, measures, values. It was as if God suddenly wrote here and on the screen appeared a euro sign, a pound sign, a rand sign, and a dollar sign. You'd know exactly what it meant, but you wouldn't know what it meant. You are weighed in the balances and found wanting. Belshazzar evaluated God at zero, so God evaluated him at zero. And that night the empire fell. That's why those vessels in chapter one are important. They caused the collapse of the entire empire. That's pretty serious stuff. I wonder, I couldn't prove it to you, but if Daniel at the beginning had some sense that by taking the wine, he might be involving himself in a situation which he couldn't easily get out of. Now, I am a fellow of an Oxford college, and I am the nearest thing to a chaplain very odd for a professor of mathematics to be that, but I am that. So from time to time, I say a Latin grace. And it's very difficult to imagine such an idolatrous culture as this without the constant presentation at the beginning of meals of libations to the gods that the students did. I can't prove that to you. But I suspect that Daniel was dimly aware of what would one day happen. And he said, no, I'll accept the education, but I will not accept the worldview that's behind it. Now, that's easy to say that, ladies and gentlemen. It's another matter of practicing it, as I have to. I live in a thoroughly secular university. Its dominant philosophy is naturalism. It's atheism. I accept the the education. Now, how do I protest? It's not easy to answer that. You will notice that the book of Daniel tells you what they did in their time. It doesn't tell you what to do in your time. You have to work that out yourself. And so, I believe that Daniel was protesting in a simple and powerful way. And the dean of students... He'd befriended the dean of students, this pagan man, 
And Daniel said to him, look, can you change our food just quietly? And the man said, oh, gosh, you're going to endanger my head with the king. Why should he see you worse off? You'll endanger my head with the king. And Daniel proposed the first controlled trial in history. And he said, look, you give us these quietly for 10 days and then judge by what you see. The issue, ladies and gentlemen, is not identity. It's image. How big an issue is that? huge. If you know anything about what's happening to many of our young people with self-harm, with the horrific cyberbullying that's going on on the internet, the loss of self-esteem, the collapse of image, it's a huge problem in our society today. People want an image. And the Babylonian culture was very much image. Good-looking young people. Do you remember the beginning? Why should he make see you looking different? You've got to look the same. I close with a little story. When I was 19, I met a Nobel Prize winner for the first time. And I talked to him a little bit at dinner, just happened to be sitting near me. And I talked to him a bit about science, and I tried to ask him whether his science had ever led him to think that there might be something behind the universe. That's as far as I got, because he was clearly not comfortable with the question. And I backed off, and that was it, I thought. But at the end of the meal, he said, Lennox, I'd like you to come to my room. And I could tell from his voice that it didn't bode well. And he invited several other professors, no students. And they took me up to the room, sat me on a chair, and they stood around me. He said, now, do you want a career in science? I said, yes, sir. Well, he said, right, tonight in front of witnesses, you're going to give up your naive ideas of God. They will cripple you. You will never look good among your peers. You'll never make it. You'll never do any good. So give it up. I'd never known pressure like that in my life. I was only 19. I couldn't help thinking that if I'd been an atheist and he a Christian doing that, he'd have lost his job the next day. But it was okay to do it, to browbeat me. So in the end, I just said, well, sir, what have you to offer me that's better than what I've already got? And he came up with the philosophy of Émile Bergson, which I knew about because I'd read C.S. Lewis. And I looked at him and said, if that's all you've got, I'll stick with what I've got and I'll take the risk. And that's one of the reasons I'm sitting here. It's one of the reasons I wrote this book on Daniel. Because in that day, steel entered my heart and soul. And I resolved that if ever... I had the chance to be in an academic position. I would present to the public as fairly as possible the evidence in the case of God and science and everything else and not try to browbeat people but allow them the dignity of making up their own minds. The book of Daniel is a book about swimming against the flow. And I'm just going to say one more thing, if I may. When you get to chapter 6, there is another protest. The civil servants want to get at Daniel because Darius was going to make him the head of the pyramid system of government. And so they were very clever they decided to get Darius to sign into being a new law. Now, the very interesting thing about this is that the big difference between Babylon and Medo-Persia is that Babylon 
was an absolute monarchy in the ancient sense. And Medo-Persia was a constitutional monarchy which had laws to which the emperor himself was subject. Now that raises a very interesting question, which is better? Well, anyway, these civil servants came to Darius and very cleverly, they said, Your Majesty, you know, this is a big country we've taken over and we think it would be a very good idea, just for a month so as we don't upset people, but to give a central focus to worship so that everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet. And we thought, Your Majesty, it might be good to have you as the object of worship. And of course he fell for it. And he signed the law and it stated twice in the chapter, according to the law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be altered or changed. And then he found he'd been tricked and Daniel ended up in the lion's den. And he spent 24 hours trying to reverse the law. And he found what many people have found down through history, that the whole point of statute law is that it is not easily reversed. He couldn't reverse it. Nebuchadnezzar would have just ignored it. But Darius had to be under it. And it's the first evidence in the book of stopping believers practicing their own faith. Up until this point, if you look carefully, you'll find that the pressure is to get believers involved in pagan practices. But here is a step, a very serious step in a negative direction. You're not allowed to practice your own faith. And ladies and gentlemen, it's happening in all of our countries today. Stealth laws, we call them. They're put on the statute book. And what do they do? You see, normally, for centuries, the law of God and the law of the land have run in parallel. Don't murder, don't murder, and so on. But now, laws are being deliberately introduced that force a clash. That if you obey them, you cannot obey scripture. And in our country, they are coming like a flood. And how long it will be before there are Christians sitting in prison, not because they have done something wrong, but because they have followed their Christian faith. I just don't know. Now, this is an appeal to lawyers. This is enormously important that the rest of us who are not trained in law have people who study these things and can help advise us because we are going to need, certainly in England and America, all the advice we can possibly get because it's so interesting that the first case of anti Christian, if you like, discrimination in this book of Daniel is by manipulating the law. And I regard that as enormously important and prescient. 26 centuries ago, the Bible's got this idea. And we are now seeing it almost for the first time in history. Well, that'll do. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Prof. Lennox. I'm sure your mind's spinning like mine. Um, those question papers we handed out so you can write down questions. If you've written something down, pass them to the center, please. If you haven't and you still want to write now, then write them down and pass them to the center. We'll collate them together. But we're going to have a five-minute stretch your legs break while we do that. I'm going to ask questions out of this batch of questions, trying to batch them together and address as many issues as we can. We're obviously not going to get anywhere near all of them. There's quite a lot of them. And I hope we, we cover the most important ones. But I've been given the, uh, the authority to choose them. And we'll see how it goes. First question. Can you say more about identity as opposed to the image we portray in our lives day to day and how we can move beyond the mask into the true identity that's given to us by God? Well, first, let me say thanks for all the questions. This is a Q&A, and you soon discover it's a very inadequate process. 
First of all, you have plumbed the depths of my ignorance. And secondly, I can only respond off the top of my head as to how I would begin to think about these questions. That doesn't matter, actually. Because if these are serious questions you're asking and not just testing what I know or don't know, you'll find that out anyway. Then the work you do afterwards in getting a satisfactory answer will last your life. So it's very important not to just leave it at this evening. Image and identity are hugely complex things. And for the sake of the exposition and getting some ideas across tonight, I separated them to a certain extent. But that is only the beginning. I was emphasizing the importance. And for a Christian, the New Testament has a great deal to say about finding our identity in Christ. One of the radically new concepts of the New Testament that you don't meet in any classical religion or philosophy is the notion of in Christ. You never get Greeks talking about in Zeus or anything like that. Uh, and therefore, it's very important to realize that these Old Testament stories, they raise questions, but there's much more to be thought about them when you come to the New Testament. And in my experience of people, often what's clogging up their lives, one possibility, there are many others, is guilt. I find that sometimes Christians who've been Christians a long time have never really understood the gospel in the sense that they've never really grasped forgiveness. And they're constantly fighting against themselves because they can't forgive themselves. And they don't realize that the, one of the most powerful things about the message of the cross is uh, Christ knew all about this. And he has died for it. But that sounds to them remote and sometimes just over-theological. But they can't grasp the fact and accept they're forgiven. And that can mess up their sense of peace and identity and everything else with it. So the important thing, I think, is that we maintain a living relationship with the Lord. Now, in a family, that means that husbands need to be praying with their wives. I'm just amazed at how many people I meet that that doesn't happen. Even young people. And, of course, we're all failures, but my wife and I have found over the years that reading some simple set of notes, nothing complex, nothing wrong, long, but something where we can relate to a piece of scripture and then pray together, it, it makes a huge difference to your sense of value. Because if you don't value your spouse enough to pray with them, there's something badly wrong if you're a Christian. Forgive me for being so blunt. But I have seen marriages repaired, my wife and I. We've seen all kinds of amazing things happen to people's sense of peace, well-being, and identity by simply getting them into those few minutes of Scripture a day. The enemy will do anything to stop you doing that. So that's just one suggestion. But I'll try and keep things short so that you can move on. Another question that came up a lot is one you suggested. How do you respond when you don't have an answer to someone? By saying, I don't know. <laughs> You've got to learn that. Because here's image, losing face. Nobody likes losing face. But you'll never lose face by hearing a question and saying you don't know how to answer it, you'll gain face. The thing that will lose you face is saying, I can answer that when it's obvious you haven't a clue. And this fear barrier can be overcome. You see, I often talk to huge audiences and I take questions. And I don't mind saying I don't know. And you know what happens when you do that? People now realize that a Christian can be human. Because some people have been educated theologically, sadly, uh, 
to think that a Christian is a person that knows the answer to every question. We don't. And here's a huge opportunity to, well, let me go back a little bit and encourage you, because I know that the most difficult thing is the initial engagement. The world is full of silent Christians who have non-Christian friends, but they never talk to them because they don't know how to begin. Well, when I meet somebody new, do you know what I try to do? I play Socrates. I keep asking questions until they ask me one. Try it. It is fascinating. And I don't mean complex questions. I mean about their families and their interests and so on. And sooner, unless they're total bores, they will ask you a question. And you befriend them that way. People love being asked questions because it is a demonstration of interest. And you can ask them all kinds of simple questions arising out of the daily news. When there's some catastrophe, you can simply say to a friend, you know, do you have resources to cope with this awful kind of thing? And don't then give them your little message. We are all desperately inclined to give them our little message, one shot, and we only get one shot. They'll never listen to us again. But that business of questions to build up confidence. And the way to learn is, once you get a question you can't answer, you say to a friend, look, I honestly, I've never met that before, and I don't know how to begin, but I'd like to think about it. Could we meet for coffee next Tuesday evening? And I'll try and think it out. People think that's marvelous. You'd actually spend time on my question. And then you'll do some work, I tell you. <laughs> and you'll never forget the answer. And when you go and present it, you'll get another question. And that's the way to develop ways of communicating with people that are natural and not preachy. As I said, Peter envisages always be ready to give a reason to people who ask you. So the onus is upon me to stimulate questions, not to preach at people. Does that make sense? But honesty and vulnerability is the main thing, and it can be very funny. I give a lecture at Harvard to about 2,500 students. You can see it online, and they're quite clever, some of them, you know. And one of them stood up, and he asked me the most complicated question imaginable. It went on and on. And when he finished, I looked at the audience, and I said, does anybody have any idea what on earth he's talking about? <laughs> and the place erupted, and that was the end of it. OK. Another one has come up a few times. If God is in control of history, how do we see the world today? And what principles can we live by to understand what's going on around us? And especially when bad things happen, are those his will? That's a virtually impossible question to answer, and you know it. <laughs> because if you look at scripture, you think Christianity started in the Roman Empire. And Paul and co. lived under Nero. Well, there's a bit of a problem for a start. And he said you must pray for kings. And he was referring to Nero, I think, at the time. And that sense of God appointing the powers that be, and yet, and yet, and yet, the apostles didn't believe in bowing down to false spiritual authority that commanded them to deny the laws of God. They were prepared to go to prison for it. And it is very, very difficult for us to second guess the complexities of God's way of governing the universe. If you don't believe that, study the lives in the Old Testament that the New Testament picks out as examples of it. And one in particular is Jacob and his children. It is one of the most complex stories that you'll ever read. Because Jacob, you remember, the parents were promised that it would be the younger, but the father didn't believe that. And then the mother saw things going down the drain, so she managed to help Jacob deceive his blind father. And so the will of God was done, was it? But then Jacob later was deceived. 
He wore a goat skin provided by his mother, and his father couldn't tell the difference between his son and a goat, which is not very impressive. <laughs> but then later on, Joseph's brothers pretended he'd been murdered, and they took a goat skin and took Joseph's coat and covered it with goat's blood. And so Jacob ended up being deceived by a goat. This shows the sophistication with the way in which God, and I just can't second guess it, but within it, the question we need to ask since we can't solve that problem is, are there enough reasons to trust God with it? That's the practical question. And I believe there are. How does one protest in the secular university, as you described? Well, as I said, we have to find our own way of doing it. And the way I do it, but that's not a necessary for anybody else to follow, that I have publicly challenged the dominant philosophy of naturalism that is prevalent in universities in many parts of the world. And so I do it by entering into public, well, it used to be debate, but now it's much more dialogue, in getting these issues into the public space and letting people see that there is an alternative to what is being preached at them through the media and so on and so forth. But protest doesn't start at the public level. All my interactions at the public level have come out of the fact that I spend an awful lot of time in my life talking to individuals. You can't start at the public level. And there's no use protesting against something if you're not standing for something. Because then you just seem like a judgmental so-and-so as we say back in England. You've got to find out, and I have a great confidence through life's experience that if we're open, the Lord will lead us. And to just, my wife, if she was here, she's a very shy person. She just says, look, drop something about God into your conversation and see what happens. If people pick it up, you can pursue it. If they don't, just let it go. And then you learn. In that sense, you're pushing against, you're swimming against the flow. I was in the taxi here the other day, and the driver was swearing every other word. And I said, excuse me, do you go to church? He said, sure. <laughs> and I said, you know, the person you keep referring to means a tremendous lot to me. And if he were your friend, you wouldn't like me talking about that. And he profusely apologized. He got it immediately. Oh, he said, do you know, I never thought of that. Now, that was a little protest. It was a very simple one. But he's learned something, you see, from it. And we have to learn in the little things. None of us ever start big. I didn't start by talking to crowds like this. I started by talking one-on-one. -on -one. And that's where you gain authority, because you know what people think because you've talked to them. You just haven't read books about what they think. You've talked to them. Can you give some advice or insight, especially to younger people, on an approach to Bible study, how to get into the Bible? We know it's valuable, but where do we start? How do we get into it? There's no shortcut to that. You see... We've got to have a revolution in our attitude to Scripture. A lot of Christians need to get converted, not to receive forgiveness and salvation, but to change their minds radically about what they think Scripture is. You can never get anywhere by reading the Bible five minutes a night and jumping into bed, especially young people who are in education You've got to learn to take Scripture seriously. And, of course, the first protest you get in this century is, I haven't enough time. And I say to people, all right, then, go home, take a piece of paper, and honestly write down on it 
the number of hours you spent this week watching a screen that has got nothing to do with either your work, your study, or your Christian faith, and then come back and tell me you've no time. The huge number of hours that are wasted with twittering and tweeting and... Do you know, when I was young, it was only the birds that tweeted. <laughs> and it is an absolute catastrophe because the psychiatrists tell me that young people are rewiring their brains. You cannot contain a lot of information in 140 or 280 characters. And that's what we're training people to do. Now, if we're going to raise a generation of young people that impact the society for God, they'll have to grow up and start taking God seriously. And I'm just glad that I was taught to do that when I was 14 and got into it. And I needed help. Now, to begin to give you advice, I just can't do it in that limited space of time. But if you have a look at my website, there's a lot of stuff on there that might help you, johnlennox.org. And if you read something like my book on Daniel, you'll see, see in it the approach to Scripture I was taught. But the man that helped me more than anybody else is Professor David Gooding, and he has written a number of very accessible books, and you can even download them free on the Internet. And if you have a look at his book, According to Luke, you'll begin to see how to get into Scripture. And I know of no other way of doing it than by doing it. And if you can get help and join a sensible Bible study group. You see, when I was a student, I could see that many people were carried along by the size of the Christian Union. When they left university, they disappeared from the scene because their faith was never real. They never learned to ask questions. So I started running a Bible study for students that met for three hours a week on a Sunday afternoon and sometimes three hours on a Wednesday night to really get people into taking Scripture as seriously as they took everything else. But I'm sorry, there's no easy... I mean, this is what you need a conference about. And even then, the real joy comes when you start doing it and you ask God to speak to you. There's far too much in churches today of mugging up sermons from the internet. And you can tell in two minutes whether people have been serious about their preparation. And it's all the time. And you know, the biggest reason for the emptying of churches in England is they don't answer questions. So it's good to be a church that answers questions, which you obviously are. Okay? Yeah, oh, sure. Isn't I, that, sorry, there's a whole lot of questions about law. And they seem to be ar around the idea of how we see statute law compared to Christian law. And if Christian law is legislated, if Christian standards are legislated, it leads to trouble. And so how do we understand the distinction between the, the two? If Christian standards are legislated, it leads to trouble. In the, in the past, when Christian... Can you give me a specific... Oh, you mean when you get a kind of theocracy where that is imposed. Oh, well, that's a, that's a very useful corrective to false impressions that might have been deduced from my minimalist approach. Um, it is very important that we're not living in a theocracy today. There is no Christian country. And what I'm talking about is much more basic than that. The basic, let me start it another way. C.S. Lewis, in the 1940s, wrote a brilliant book called The Abolition of Man. Very short book. And it has an appendix which he rather misleadingly calls it Tao. It doesn't mean Taoism in, in China. What he means is that as you look around the different philosophies and religions in the world, you find, of course, differences, but the remarkable thing is the amount of commonality you find. And he calls it the Tao, and he points out, for instance, that the golden rule, as we call it, do unto others what you would that they did to you, is to be found in every religion and philosophy that there's ever been under the sun. And he quotes them all, dozens and dozens and dozens. And you see, from my point of view, that is the biblical point of view, I hope, 
The reason there is this commonality is that we're hardwired for morality. We are rational beings, but we're not only rational beings, we're moral beings made in the image of God. If we weren't, society would flow apart. And the idea of law didn't begin with a codification of law, either in the Code of Hammurabi or in Scripture. Because, as the New Testament points out, there is something written on our heart, or as we would say, on our conscience that we're aware of. And for centuries, by and large, the law of states has, certainly in the West, in Europe, has followed that kind of law that we recognize in the Bible. We're not talking about things that are specifically Christian. We're talking about right and wrong as intrinsic concepts. Once you start imposing religious law, whether it was Christian or Sharia law and so on, that can lead to a lot of trouble. The problem comes, as Daniel indicates, when legislation is passed that begins to change the basic parameters of existence and redefine things that we have accepted as correct for centuries. And particularly in the area of human relationships, we know that that is happening. And therefore, we have to do a lot of very hard thinking. We are required by Scripture to obey the powers that be. That's one side of it. But when the powers that be, that were, commanded the apostles to stop preaching, for example, they say, look, whether it's right to listen to you, you have to judge, but we're not going to shut up. That was exceeding their powers. And the danger is that we're coming to a point where the state can exceed its powers. Now, if you are put in prison because you say that a certain part of Scripture is still valid, well, you'll have to go to prison. There's no way of avoiding it. And there are people sitting in prison in several European countries precisely because they say, without being demagogic about it, that Scripture still applies today. So that is what I mean. The kind of imposition, as happened in the Middle Ages, with remnants of it trailing down to my country, Northern Ireland, that's the thing that poses a problem. I mean, many people say to me, look, you're Irish. How on earth do you remain being Christian? Because people fight over it as if they're trying to impose Christianity by force, which some of them, their theology teaches them that, and unfortunately on both sides. That comes from Constantine. It doesn't come from Scripture. And in that circumstance... You have to be very careful to explain the Christian attitude to violence. And when it comes to, if you like, defending Christ and his message, the answer is obvious. He tells you to put your sword away. My kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my servants would have been fighting. And it should be utterly obvious why that is the case. Pilate could see that. You see... One of the things that interests me about Scripture is I used to wonder, there's a lot about the death and resurrection of Jesus in the New Testament, but I could never understand why there is so much about his trial until I met the Christopher Hitchens of this world and suddenly realized that Christ was accused of terrorism. That's exactly what he was accused of fomenting political terrorism. And that trial then becomes crucially important. What is the Christian stance? And Pilate, who was no fool, conducted the trial himself. He didn't even have a trial lawyer. He did it himself because it was such a sensitive case. Was this person a threat to the rule of Rome? Are you a king? Well, not in the way you mean, said Jesus. My kingdom isn't of this world. Otherwise, my servants would have been fighting. To this end, I was born. And to this end, I came into the world so that I should bear witness to the truth. And Pilate, hardened soldier that he was, what is truth? And he went out and said Jesus was innocent. He realized what all of us need to realize, that the one thing you cannot do with violence is impose truth. 
especially if it's truth about forgiveness, the love of God, peace with God, and salvation. And we need that message in our societies today. My country still needs it, although it's much more peaceful than it was. It is so important that we realize that the New Testament deals with things. And because we look into the past, we talk about the uh, trial of Christ as if it was not relevant to the 21st century. It's totally relevant. It's a terrorist trial. That makes a big difference to me, if that makes sense to you. Maybe we need to stop. It's over half an hour. Are there any questions? Well, want? I'm happy to stop, but thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your questions and for listening. And you know where there's more information on Daniel. And there are several books. There's one coming out soon on Joseph. So thanks a lot, and God bless you all. And thank you. Sorry? Please. I just asked Prof. Lenski if you would pray for us in closing. Father, we do thank you so much for a common interest in your word. And even beyond that, a sense of your presence and the life that you so wonderfully give us in the Lord Jesus. Help us to be faithful to him. Help us to understand your word and to develop our relationship with you from day to day and give us courage, even in simple and gentle ways to begin to communicate to our society around us. We pray for this church and its ministers and the teams of people involved in the Bible study that have organized this evening. We commit them to you and the young people that are with us tonight open their minds and eyes and teach them how to get to know you and your word better and equip them to witness to a world of increasing complexity and intellectual and moral danger. So, Lord, encourage us with your presence through the night, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.